Welcome to everybody. Uh, so here we are with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Michaela Timus, and uh, and we have this uh, very interesting topic uh, to analyze thanks to her work. And uh, uh, for us in in the uh, Secretary School in Florence, this is the first time that we do um, a section in English. Uh, we call this kind of classes uh, dialoghi per capire. So they are dialogue to understand. And actually, in the intervention of uh, uh, Michela will be really very interesting because uh, she is a, an expert in, uh, in the uh, old uh, ancient Iraqi world. So Zoroastrian tradition and the Christian Judeo tradition will be analyzed together. So um, uh, I met uh, Michaela because she was interested in uh, coming to our school, uh, interested in, 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 in painting actually. And then uh, we understood that we, we have uh, in common also, also these uh, studies about re religion. So uh, just to, uh, to give a few information about Michaela, she received her PhD in Paris in, in the School uh, of um, uh, High Studies in the section of uh, Religious uh, Science um, in 2000, 2009. She is co-founder of the Institute for the History of Religions of the Romanian Academy. Uh, this happened in 2008. And uh, uh, she was associated researcher uh, to college the, the France in uh, 2013 and 50, 15. And then also she spent uh, uh, two years in, um, in, uh, in Germany in the Alexander von Humboldt uh, Fellow Institute for Iraqinist uh, um, uh, in, uh, in, in German. So she, she wrote many publications, uh, but I think that uh, the best way is just to give to her uh, the, the the word so that uh, she can she can speak about the topic. Thank you, Michela. No, well, thank you very much, Giancarlo, and good evening, everybody. All people that I know that I met maybe in Florence last summer, and all colleagues and friends. Um, so welcome, everybody, and um, I will uh, hide myself also. Um, so we will try to see if the PowerPoint is going on. Is this fine? Yeah, yeah, yes, it's yes. fine. Everything yes. is fine. Thank you very much for your feedback. So um, I would like to thank um, Giancarlo uh, Polenghi, who had the generous idea to value uh, my previous work, um, uh, which is a monograph on the Zoroastrian cosmogonic and eschatological ideas, um, a book printed in 2015, a reshaped part um, of my uh, PhD defended in um, 2009 at Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes um, in, in, in Paris at Sorbonne. And on the other uh, hand, the outcome of my private artistic activities, uh, which I developed during this pandemic uh, period. So, um, um, I would like to dedicate this talk to two persons dear to me, Mariana and Sandu Voiku, who celebrate today two special anniversaries. And um, I also, because life is uh, full of um, unexpected events, uh, good or bad, I have to add a thought of compassion and gratitude to the memory of Professor Shaul Shaked, uh, Professor Emeritus of Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who unfortunately passed away yesterday. So a distinguished scholar of Middle Persian and Aramaic studies, um, a historian of religions himself. And I hope that the present talk is in tune with the spirit of his researches. And I would also like to add a word to, of compassion to his wife, Miriam uh, Shaked, who was born in Romania and uh, to his um, family. So today I would like to propose a short comparison between the creation vision according to two religious traditions. On the one hand, 
the one of the Genesis book, which opens the Old Testament, offering a vision shared by both Jewish and Christian traditions. And on the other hand, the one of the Zoroastrian religion, which is one of the most ancient and still living religions in the world. It is still practiced nowadays by a number of around 80,000 followers who are active in Iran, India, um, uh, UK, the United States, Canada or China. Um, I should say from the very beginning that I'm not a historian of art myself, but I am happy to share here with you a selection of the marvels I could see in original last summer in Florence, while I were a student myself in painting and drawing of the Scuola di Arte Sacra of Florence. So I would like to propose you a short reading of the introductory paragraphs of the Genesis book as according to the English translation of the Bible um, of La Bible de Jerusalem, the Bible of Jerusalem. So, and um, this reading is accompanied by um, iconographical representations from the, uh, the mosaics uh, which adorn the inner walls of the um, cathedral in Montreale, um, in, uh, which, is to, uh, which finds itself in the metropolitan city of Palermo in Sicily. And they are dated, these um, iconographical monuments are dated, the mosaics are dated from the 12th to 13th century. So let's see the text in their simple letters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was a formless void, there was darkness over the deep, and God's spirit hovered over the water. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God called light day, and darkness he called night. Evening came, and morning came, the first day. I will emphasize this um, uh, final um, phrase which is repeated every time when a day of the creation is repeated is, is uh, presented evening came and morning came a second day um, God said let there be a vault in the waters to divide the waters in two and so it was God made the vault and it divided the waters above the vault from the waters under the vault God called the vault heaven Evening came and morning came, the second day. As you can see, the image on the right um, faithfully follows the text by figuring uh, very clearly the waters uh, above the vault um, and the waters under the vault. The third day, God said, let the waters under heaven come together into a single mass and let dry land appear. And so it was. God called the dry land earth and the mass of water seas. And God saw it was good. God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and fruits, trees bearing fruit with their seed inside on the earth. Evening came and morning came, the third day. On the fourth day, God said, let there be light in the vault of heaven to divide day from night and let them indicate festivals, days and years. Let them be light in the vault of heaven to shine on the earth. And so it was. God made the two great lights the greater light to govern the day, the smaller light to govern the night. Evening came and morning came, the fourth day. It is clear that the greater light to govern the day is a sun and the smaller light to govern the night is a moon. On the fifth day, God said, let the waters teem with living creature and let birds fly above the earth within the vault of heaven. And so it was. God created great sea serpents and every day of living creature with which the waters steam and every lean and every kind of winged creature. God saw that it was good. Evening came and morning came, the fifth day. On the sixth day, God said, 
Let the earth produce every kind of living creature, cattle, reptiles, and every kind of wild beast. And so it was. God said, Let us make man in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves, and let them be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of heaven, the cattle. God created man in the image of himself, in the image of God he created him, him, male and female he created them. Evening came and morning came, the thick day. And the last day of the week, the seventh on the uh, on the seventh day, the heaven and the earth were already completed with all their array. On the seventh day, God completed the work he had been doing, and he rested on the seventh day after all the work he had been doing. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on that day he had rested after all his work of creating. Such were the origins of heavens and earth when they were created. So these are the, this is a dis description of the um, uh, creation process as according to the um, um, uh, Genesis book um, in the Old Testament. Now, this, it is less known for me where from um, these um, mosaics come. Most likely their source of inspiration is a Byzantine art. But it should be mentioned that there were also codexes circulating between East and West, like the illustrated manuscript known as the Vienna Genesis, which, was, um, which is a luxury, luxurious codex written down on purple parchment and which might have been accomplished in Syria by the 6th century. It contained the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old uh, of the Hebrew Old Testament, version of the Bible known also as the Septuagint, and um, to which I will make reference here uh, later on. The quotation I have just given you are according to the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. Um, the various books were accompanied by illustrations. The various books of the Old Testament were accompanied by illustrations, as one can see on this uh, folio of the Vienna Genesis, one of the few remaining. It is when you, you can see here the story of Adam and Eve, the temptation story and the expulsion of um, this primordial uh, human pair out of paradise. Unfortunately, almost nothing is known about the early historical context of this codex. Um, most likely, the mosaics of the Montreale Cathedral are the only iconographical documents in the Western art, or the last ones, illustrating into detail each one of the days of the creation. A bit later on, by the 13th up to 14th century, the mosaics of the Baptisterium of Florence, for instance, will not reproduce anymore into detail all the six steps of the creation process concluded with the seventh day of the divine rest. The story of the creation is condensed in a single image, as one can see here. See here is one of the mosaics, and here is the context where one can see um, um, of the cupola of the baptisterium. And much later on, in his own way, the I mean, in, in, in the way of his naive painting, the Russian-French painter, Marc Chagall, known for his numerous illustrations of, to the Bible, will give himself a representation of the creation process concentrated in a single image, as one can see here. Beginning with the 13th and 14th century, the iconography related to the Genesis book of the Bible is much more focused focused on its second and third chapters, on the appearance of the first human pair, man and woman, Adam and Eve, on their journey through the Garden of Eden, the temptation and the expulsion out of paradise. This is what ca one can often see in various co contexts, like the mosaics of the Baptisterium of Florence here, 
or uh, on the sculpted scenes of the um, bell tower of the Dome of Florence, um, which are attributed either to Andrea Pisano or to Giotto. Please, um, please correct me if um, at the end of this talk, um, if I'm wrong, um, or like Pacino. So these are the details of this wonderful um, sculptures, which are nowadays, the originals are nowadays preserved in the Opera del Duomo um, di Firenze, um, or like in the iconography of Pacino di uh, Buonghi Guida. In the lower part of his famous Tree of Life, or Lign uh, Lignum Vitae, which one could see on display last summer in the Bargello Museum of Florence, these scenes are also represented. And Bu Buon Guida, I would like to mention here, co counts also among the first uh, illustrators of um, Dante's Divine Commedia. Um, this tradition will culminate in the 15th century with a big format temptation scene by Masolino da Panicale, one can see in the Cappella Brancacci in the Florentine Church Santa Maria del Carmine, or with the expulsion scene by Masaccio dramatically displaying Adam, Adam, Adam's shame and Eve's defigurating suffering. One can see very well here. And this painting is also kept in the same Cappella Brancacci. Now, at least, and last but not least, in a similar vein, and again in his, in his own naive way, Marc Chagall will figure out the same scenes, the creation of men and Eve's creation out of Adam. Now, getting back to the six steps of the um, creation process as described to the Genesis book. By summarizing, as I had a summary here, I will go back. By summarizing, one can notice that um, the six days of the creation um, put forward a kind of network of elements. So the first day, one sees the appearance of heaven and earth and of light as well. On the second day, on a, on a second day, the waters above and the uh, waters uh, below. Um, on another day, animals and prawns are supposed to populate the earth. And on the last day, mammifers are created, like birds um, and um, like, like um, 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 animals and um, mankind. And this is a detail I would like to um, emphasize because I will get back and it will, might be useful in the comparison with the um, Zoroastrian um, doctrine of um, the creation. Now, within the history of Christianity, the first book of Genesis inspired a whole rich tradition of exegetical commentaries known as the hexamelon literature. The most important names, I will quote just a few ones, are Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan in the fifth century, Saint Augustine or Augustine of Hippo from the same uh, period, a few Syriac authors like Jacob of Serug from the fifth to sixth century or Jacob of Edessa, sixth to seventh century. Ambrose seems to have been the most influential and his commentaries on the Genesis book were most likely included in his pulpit sermons he publicly, he publicly gave. Now, I would like to refer here particularly to St. Augustine, who wrote extensively on the topic, on this uh, topic. There are three main works um, as follows on Genesis, which is a refutation of the Manichaeans, an unfinished literal, literal commentary on Genesis, and a third work, which is a literal meaning of Genesis. And each uh, one of such, uh, each of these works 
could make the object of longer series of talks or of um, classes for one year. But um, I would like to um, quote, as you can see here, um, um, and to give a quotation of one of these works, because the story of this first days of the creation of the world was not devoid of criticism. Uh, from the very early stages, one noticed that there were some preeminent incoherences. From the very first day of the creation, as I underlined while reading, the text repeats that there was evening, um, that evening came and morning came. But uh, um, more than one wondered how could there have been evening and morning while the luminaries, the sun and the moon, were not created but on the fourth day of the creation. And this is one uh, example, and such, such criticism occurred, for instance, as early as the third century of Christ era, with um, a personality, personality like Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, who conceived himself a quite complex cosmogonic vision. On the screen, you can see a reference of St. Augustine, in, uh, um, taken out of his uh, first uh, work, I quoted on Genesis, where, in fact, he quotes this position of the um, Manichaean. He says, here, the first question they ask, they, in this context, are the Manichaeans. They ask, is how it was on the fourth day that the constellations were made, that is, sun and moon and star, stars. How, after all, could the three previous days have been without the sun, since now we see that it takes the rising and the setting of the sun to complete a day? So this post critical position is already mentioned by um, um, uh, St. Augustine. Now, I found it relevant to mention um, um, such a detail and um, particularly this um, work of St. Augustine, um, who himself um, belonged to this religious community as an auditor, a layman follower, for around nine years before becoming a Christian himself. Manichaeism was a religion which occurred by the third century, so a bit before Augustine in the Persian Empire. And, um, um, and uh, um, found um, um, itself under the reign of the so-called Sasanian dynasty. You can see here the two towns where um, Mani was uh, born. So um, he, uh, where Mani lived, he was born in Ctesiphon on the nowadays territory of Iraq, and he died in Gundeshapur in um, the nowadays Iran. Um, so I am in a series of kings, some of which, um, so um, the Sasanian dynasty, the historians of uh, Christian um, of the Christian Church might be familiar. Uh, with some uh, of the most famous Sasanian kings. For instance, uh, the Byzantine king Heraclius um, uh, was uh, fought often against Khosrow II, the last important Sasanian king before the Arab conquest of um, Iran. Now, Mani was born, so as I said, in the Persian Empire. He knew the language spoken in the empire, which was the Middle Persian. And I am pleased to, to give you such details because they are a good introduction to the second part uh, of my talk and to the second um, uh, comparison term um, I propose you today, that of Zoroastrianism. And the literature I will quote you out is in Middle Persian, the, the language Mani himself uh, knew and spoke. He belonged, Mani, to a circle of Judeo-Christians. His father was himself a Judeo-Christian, known as the Elkasites, a group paying particular respect to the ritual practice of baptism. So 
Mani polemicized against the sect and this sect and founded a new religion, the Manichaean one. This means that he knew quite well the Jewish sacred writings, including the Genesis book, for which he brought one of the most lost lasting, uh, long lasting um, criticism. And he built up his own religious vision of the creation for process, which is very elaborate, being inspired by Zoroastrianism, which as a religion predated both Manichaeism and Christianity for a few centuries, at least eight centuries before Christ. Now, as many of you might already know, even better than me, uh, Marc Chagall did a series of illustrations accompanying various books of the Old Testament. And some of these drawings were published in Paris in the 60s under the title Drawings from the Bible. Now, among these illustrations, I um, two are referring to the book of Esther, one of the chapters, one of the um, of the chapters of the Old Testament. The story has as background the first exile of the Jews during the period of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Now, Shafgal focused what is interesting, and I'm using these examples as in order to better introduce my second term of the comparison. He focused, Shagal focused on two women, on the two women of the Persian king called in the Hebrew Bible, um, uh, called in the Hebrew uh, version of the Old Testament, Ahasuerus. While in the Greek version of the Old Testament or the Septuagint, um, he is called by a name more clo closer to um, the historical reality, namely Artaxerxes. Most likely, the historical character taken into account is in fact Xerxes I, who reigned by the 5th century, the Achaemenid king who conducted the attack against the Greeks and was defeated at Salamina. Now, the first painting, as which you see here and now, portrayed the first wife of the Persian king, Vashti, who is said for, of not having obeyed the order of the king to show him herself in front of the court. So therefore, together with his viziers, um, the Persian king banished Vashti um, and he began looking for another wife. The second painting of Mark Chagall so here is a um, text of the Bible. On the seventh day, when the king was married with wine, he commanded the seventh eunuchs in attendance of the persons of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king crowned with her royal diadem in order to display her beauty to the people and administrators, for she was very beautiful. But King Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. The king was very angry at this and his rage grew hot. It grew so hot that Chagall depicted him in red. And in the right, on the right side, the queen is uh, full of shame. Now the second drawing of Chagall um, represents the second wife of the um, Achaemenid Persian king, Esther, who was an adopted daughter of a Jewish man working at the court of the Persian king. She, um, so his name is Mordecai, and um, she will come at the Persian court um, accompanied by Mordecai, her adopting father, and um, um, and she because she will please so much the Persian king, um, she will become the uh, new queen of the Persians. Now, it's one can read in the book of Esther to um, beginning to five from five to nine. In the citadel of Susa, 
uh, which is supposed to be, um, which was one of the capitals of the Achaemenid um, kings. There is there are some anachronisms in the in the book of Esther um, because Xerxes was not a king in with a capital in Susa. But um, there lived a Jew called Mordecai, says the text of the Bible, who had been deported from Jerusalem among the captives taken away by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He had brought up Hadassah, otherwise called Esther, his uncle's daughter. On the death of her parents, Mordecai, Mordecai had adopted her as his daughter. So the girl pleased the Sasanian king, uh, the Archaemenic king, king, and won his favor. So um, Esther is known as the um, uh, Jewish queen who will protect the Jews who found refu refuge, ref ref who found refuge in the Achaemenid Empire, because some of the um, close people of the um, Achaemenid uh, king were against Mordecai. The, the Jewish man at the court, at the court of um, Xerxes, and which one sees here depicted in uh, Chagall's um, drawing. And because they were so much against Mordecai, they planned to kill him on the Purim uh, feast. This is what is described in the book of Esther 9, um, 24. Um, now, what is interesting and um, as scholars um, have um, uh, showed this in detail. I'm referring here, here particularly to the, um, uh, an article of Almut Hinze, who uh, presented this work in one of the gatherings organized by Shaul Shaked, and they were called Irano Judaica. Um, so, and she um, underlined very well that while in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, um, the name of the feast is Purim, or to cast poor or lots, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the feast is called Furtia, which was identified by um, uh, scholars um, as the Greek version of the Persian term known as Provardigan, which is an Ira Iranian feast in honor of what one calls in Avestan, one of the old Iranian languages, Frawashi, or the guardian spirits of the deceased ones. So one identified recently, Professor uh, Grenet uh, identified recently um, um, the feast um, as um, um, this feast in um, um, is represented symbolically in this uh, on um, on a um, uh, Bactrian silver plate um, of Sasanian style, which was um, um, late, uh, which will co come appear later on um, um, in late antiquity uh, from the seventh century under the form of a lady. You can see here uh, on the right uh, who keeps in her hand an incense burner, which was used in funerary context. Um, according to Arab, an Arab author, Al-Biruni, Zoroastrians fumigate their houses with janitor so that the dead can enjoy the smell. To the left on this um, uh, Bactrian uh, silver plate, one identified um, um, another um, um, a character with holds in the hands a lotus flower and a falcon, we, and which are both good symbols of the new year or Novruz in Iran. Now, um, this story uh, of Esther is a good introduction in, in, in the vision of, um, which I, I, I resumed here in, according to the iconographical vision of Chagall, is a um, good introduction um, to this second part of my talk, um, which concerns the cosmogonical vision of the Zoroastrians. So as I said, Zoroastrianism is one of the most ancient um, still living religions in the world, um, which was found, found, founded by um, 
um, Zarathustra, um, the founding text of this religion, the Gathas, are attributed by certain scholars to uh, Zarathustra or Zoroaster. And um, there are different chronologies for this text. So um, the chronology of this religion or of its founding text vary, varies between the 12th uh, century before Christ and the 8th century uh, before Christ era. Now, um, this... Um, so here you can see the the um, the context um, of the silver plate where one can. Now the vision of the um, uh, the narrative of the Zoroastrian creation process arrived to us by means of a much later writing um, known as Bundahishin or the original creation. Um, even yet, even though written down by the ninth century of Christ era after the Arab conquest of Iran, um, it is supposed to have gathered much older elements preserved and transmitted orally. So um, this could be the object um, of another academic um, talk. Um, the narrative preserves a cosmogonic scene, scheme which is present in the Avesta, the main liturgical text of the Zoroastrians, which is as old as the Achaemenid Empire or the background of the story of the Jewish queen Esther. Now, I would leave the text to speak by themselves so that you may have um, um, a direct comparison with the book, or with the Genesis book. And um, I uh, accompanied each day, each moment, each step of the creation process according to the Zoroastrian vision by some other images. They are taken out of uh, ossuaries, which were found in Central Asia and which are um, like this one, um, which is dated by, um, by the uh, 7th to 8th uh, century and where uh, various characters are depicted and which were identified as the Amesha Spenta or the beneficial immortals, which are supposed to be patrons of each one of the um, fundamental um, elements of the creation process. Now let's see what the above mentioned text, Bundahishin, says about the creation process. So first, he created the sky. He is Ormazd, or the, the god, the great god of Zoroastrians. He created the sky, bright, visible, distant, in the form of an egg made of shining iron. First, he, Ormazd, or the great god, fashioned the sky in 40 days. He rested five days. And you can see on the right side, you can see Shahrevar, or one of the immortal, bene um, um, uh, of a beneficial immortal. This is one of the, the most um, recent translations of the original term Amesha Spenta. Um, Amahraspand in Middle Persian, which is supposed to be the patron of the sky and which was um, identified on one of the ossuaries of Central Asia. Um, water. Now, the second step of the pro creation process includes water. He fashioned water from the essence of the sky. Second, he created the water in 55 days. He rested five days. Now here, what you see depicted is Hordad, or the patron of the waters, which is represented under the uh, form of a female character um, who keeps in mortar in one um, in one hand and a stem in the other, um, as uh, researchers of Professor Grenet um, underlined, because he did the identification of this character. Now the third step is the earth. Third, he created the earth from the water, round with wide open spaces. He fixed it in the very middle of the sky. In the, in the earth, he created the essence of the mountains that would later flow from it. 
Third, he created the earth in 70 days. He rested five days. And what you can see here is Spandarmat, the patron of the earth. The fourth step of the creation is the moment when the vegetation or the plants are created. Fourth, or Mars, he created the plant. It sprouted up initially in the middle of the earth, several feet tall, without branch, bark or thorn, moist and sweet. Its nature contained all the species and vital forces of plants. To aid the plant, he created water and fire. Fourth, he created the plants in 25 days. He rested five days. So what you can see here is Amudad, or the pattern of vegetation, here depicted again on them the form of a female character which holds a plant in her hands as a pattern of vegetation. The fifth step is the creation of animal. Fifth, he, fa he fashioned the sole created cow in a runwells in the middle of the world. It was white and bright like the moon. Fifth, he created cattle in 75 days. He rested five days. And here the Bachman or uh, Vohuman is a pattern of the animals and is depicted here under the form of a um, male character, a beard man with a crown, um, like any one of these beneficial immortals. This character holds a spoon or a like instrument for libation and a plate on which one can see an animal. Unfortunately, maybe here you cannot see very clearly, but there is an animal, a pig or a wild boar. So this, is, uh, this was one of the main arguments in the ident identification of this character as pa Wachmann, which is known from the text as a patron of animals or of cattle. So all these um, Amesha Spenta or Amakra Spandan have uh, crowns, um, not because they would be kings, but they are presiding, each one of them is presiding over um, one of the um, fundamental elements of the creation forces. And in the end, mankind thinks he fashioned Gayomad. Gayomad is a name of the, of the first human being bright as the sun, as tall as four measured rods, his width equal to his height. Man will be born from his seed in his likeness. Fish, he created cattle in 75 days. He rested five days. So in this case, I might not have an image because the patron of the creation of, man, of the man is Ormas, the great god. And there are very few, if none, representation of, representations of Ormas. But... Um, so an Arvahisht is another um, is the six of the of the um, is the six of the six um, um, beneficial immortals who is a patron of fire and as you can see in this case is a very clear example of how um, the symbolical elements they bear they wear um, are related to historical elements because this. Um, Im beneficial immortal has a crown very much alike to the crown um, to the crown of certain Sasanian kings. Now, in this in the Zoroastrian case, now I would like to conclude my talk by underlining the common elements between the two traditions as well as the differences. So, the similarities are that the process of creation takes place in six steps, along one week in the Jewish case, in the case of the Genesis, along one year in the second Zoroastrian case. As you could see, the number of days along which every element is created is much longer. For the man, it's 75 days. For the plants, 25 days. The elements created are slightly the same, but introduced in a different way. The idea of a divine rest is present in both cases. It takes place at the end of the whole process, the seventh days in the case of the Genesis book, and it takes place periodically at the end of each great period of the creation process. Now, the differences might be also um, 
important. In the Zoroastrian case, more important than the narrative is a systematic organization of analogies and correspondences. And this is one of the aspects which makes the Zoroastrian cosmogonic view very consistent, fact which is an argument in favor of its originality. I may say, and this is, these are discussions I took into account in my book, I uh, showed you at the beginning of my talk that some scholars saw that the Zoroastrian view was influenced by the book, the Genesis book. Some others thinks to the contrary, like Jakob Neusner, um, that in fact, this uh, coherent um, aspect of the Zoroastrian cosmogony is an argument in favor of its antiquity. And he thinks, in fact, that the book of the Genesis was influenced by um, uh, the Zoroastrian vision, fact which is historically can be argued because Jews and, and Iranians shared the same, um, uh, uh, were in the same areas as the book of Esther um, um, speaks about. Now, the network I'm referring to of correspondences includes a series of five periods, the seasonal feasts, which are regularly celebrated along the whole year. They are still celebrated nowadays, but their original cosmogonic meaning was progressively lost, mostly after the Islamization of Iran. Um, another element of this network of correspondences is the fact that the five divinities or beneficial immortals, I showed you here, accompanying the, the text of the cosmogonic narrative. So the six characters which preside over each one of the six cosmogonic steps, they give the names of the days of the week, for instance, according to the uh, Zoroastrian calendar. And six of the 12 months of the year bear their names as well, which makes a strong connection between the cosmogonic view and the calendar, the Zoroastrian calendar, which is also a very important element, both of the religion and of the daily life. Um, the whole Zoroastrian vision is very systematic, as the Manichaean one, the one uh, against which um, St. Augustine wrote various polemical treatises, is organized according to three stages. The text I have just read for the Zoroastrian part reflect only the first stage, which is one of fewer immobility, of highest degree of abstraction. Two, others, two other stages are supposed to follow, namely, on the one hand, the passage to mobility, to a more concrete shape, which remains at the same time abstract, as abstract as the mythological fancy-like entities, like the primordial mountain Albors. On the other hand, the final stage includes the installation of the world as we can perceive it here and now. The sky, full of clouds or stars, not just an abstract entity, a sterile idea of a sky in itself. The water of the seas we can sail on or the lakes around which we can walk, not just a simple idea of water. There are other elements which may make the difference between the Zoroastrian and the Jewish cosmogonic view. The question, for instance, of the, inter of the ritual integration and the ritual and the liturgical integration of such a vision is a matter of debate. It is present within Zoroastrianism, but at the same time, the Genesis book is very present in the Catholic liturgy of the Easter feast, which accompanies the celebration of Christ's resurrection. In this respect, there is a huge difference between the Catholic and Orthodox tradition, this latter one being focused on the text of the Melkite author John of Damascus. But these are details I may not be able to uh, get into detail now. Before putting an end to this talk, at Giancarlo Polenghi's suggestion, I dare to share briefly with you some of my personal oil paint paintings, a series inspired by these narratives of creation. While during this pandemic, I was painting and sharing the outcome with some dear friends, the text of the Bible remained in the background. At the same time, in their com concept, they proved to be closer to the simplicity of the Zoroastrian vision, where each element was created separately and first of all in a very abstract way. I used colors and certain movements in order to express this state of primordial simplicity, 
a great potential on the verge of exploding through subsequent steps. I think it is a good metaphor for any kind of creative act, be it artistic, scholarly, or simply human. There is an extraordinary force of the beginning in each case, the beginning of a painting, drawing, or sculpture, the beginning of an article, a book, or an essay, the beginning of a relationship, and nonetheless, nonetheless the act of giving birth. As a matter of fact, in many of the old mythologies, the Zoroastrian one included as well, God's creation of the world is, is expressed as a huge measureless pregnancy followed by a violent earthquake-like installation of the basic elements. The sky, the water, the earth, the plant, the animal, and the human. Thank you for your patience and presence. Thank you very much. I'm ready. Then thank you, thank you, uh, Michaela. I think it's uh, it's very interesting what you were um, sharing with us, um, and and of course, a uh, few questions uh, that were coming to my mind. Uh, maybe this is I I don't know if I understood well, but uh, uh, this link between the patrons uh, is not un underlying a, a differences between the Christian Jewish God that is completely outside and the Zoroastrian God. I mean, are those patrons like different gods or, or it's just a figure that it's I don't know if, yeah, if you are touching, yeah, you are touching a very sensible chord of this um, of the scholarly debates. Was Zoroastrianism um, monotheistic or a polytheistic um, um, religion? So they are called divinities. They are not really gods, but there are other gods like Srosh uh, Srausha, which um, ha plays a very important role in the creation um, in the in the in the creation system because. It is not the, he, he helps, he is an intercessor element, he is an intercessor god, um, uh, helping Ormas, which remains an absolute transcend, uh, absolutely transcend, uh, transcendent um, to um, accomplish the creation process. So it's like, um, um, it, the, the Zoroastrian system, pan, there is a pantheon, so there are various divinities which are governed by a single god. So it's like um, a yeah. polytheistic system which, uh, which has the form of a pyramid, pyramidal, um, uh, of a pyramid, and in, um, at, the, at the top of this pyramid is only one god. So I, I, I think this is very interesting because, because in, in a way, something that is very uh, kind of uh, new in the, in, in the Judaic Christian view is this uniqueness of God that is completely outside everything. So the creator as, but then uh, uh, what, what I think is very interesting is the six steps like something that is very common. I mean, the two tradition, they have the same path, although the timetable is different, but yeah. actually having six steps is very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of the details oh, which made one thing that um, uh, Zoroastrianism was influenced by, by um, um, the Genesis book, but things are debatable because this scheme um, uh, the six-fold scheme, creation scheme, is mentioned regularly in the Avesta, and the Avesta is um, is as old as um, as Xerxes, or the 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 context where uh, the story of Esther takes place. So it's um, the problem is that um, the Zoroastrian tradition is eminently an oral tradition. For a long period, it was transmitted or, or, or orally, as these things happened in India as well. 
So, um, and this um, rich pantheon is um, is um, is um, a trace of its antique of its antiquity and its Indo-Iranian background. So, one can argue one can argue very much in favor of the stable, autonomous character of the Zoroastrian cosmogonic vision. And of course, they shared. They could have shared, but the the Jewish vision could have been developed independently. Um, I, I I agree with what certain scholars said. They say it's less important who influenced whom. Yeah. More important is how consistent this um, scheme or this pattern is in, within the one one tradition or another. And what is to be said and underlined is that this uh, cosmogonic vision is very consistent in the in the Zoroastrian case. And all these correspondences, they develop within the calendar, between the seasonal feasts, because their whole year is a period of celebration. At the end of this, um, I, I didn't have time. I might not have, I would, it would have been too long to get into detail yeah. to show how these creation periods um, match and accompany the calendar and how they yes. what are the periods um, um, according to our Gregorian calendar because the calendars are not at all the same so yeah, they, yeah, still, yeah. Um, they still celebrate these periods those five days you you you, you notice that God in the Zoroastrian uh, version uh, takes a rest during, uh, but, uh, during the five last days of the bigger period of the creation of each element so yeah, those yeah, days yeah. Are the days which nowadays are considered the the the, the feast um, the, the moment of feast uh, um, because they conclude uh, a, a cosmogonic process. So the importance of these periods is that they celebrate um, yeah. a cosmogonic moment. Even though in, because of the Islamization of Iran, it should be underlined for those who don't know that Zoroastrianism is not an is not a Muslim religion, even though even though it is still practiced by minorities in in um, in a Muslim country like Iran, but yes, it's not yes. it's not a Muslim yes. religion. Uh, I, I have two other questions. The first one is uh, this co cosmogonic uh, view uh, from the Zoroastrian tradition. Do you think that uh, was kind of uh, related also to other tradition aside the Jewish Christian? I'm, I'm meaning Indian um, or, or other religious tradition that, that are um, around the world are also related to this cosmogony or not? Well, uh, there is a background, an Indo-Iranian Indo background um, and there might have been, um, they had common elements. Um, there are more elements in the practice of rituals. I may not say now into detail um, if this uh, scheme in six steps has um, um, an Indian counterpart. I don't think so. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, but okay. And it is also a problem. For instance, you may ask me, what is this story with the huge pregnancy of the great God, which is also a metaphor of of the creation and this is also debatable because it occurs in a late text and it could have been a later addition so as long as there is not so much uh, the, the, the metaphor is not very much detailed it might be a borrowing from gnostic circles or i mean the influences um uh, appear um beginning with the late antiquity, then the influences are very strong. The Indo-Iranian background is important, but then um, Zoroastrianism develops its own its own patterns. And even yeah. though term scholars were often attracted by common terms, but um, slowly one noticed that despite the, the common no names, at, um, um, the visions are completely different. Yeah, and another two two uh, questions. Um, in in the Judeo Christian tradition, um, the creation is done just with the word, yeah. saying something something happened, and then also uh, part of the creation is just uh, cutting, separating things. Mm. These are kind of two concepts. Of course, in the Christian view, 
uh, is the Trinity that is creating. So basically we see uh, in the Genesis also uh, a prefig prefiguration of the Trinity uh, uh, like uh, the spirit that the, the wind that is going uh, over the sea, for example, and other things. Uh, but uh, in the creation, uh, in the Christian view, uh, we see uh, something about uh, uh, the creator. So the creator is kind of manifesting himself in the creation. Do you think that also in the Zoroastrian tradition is the same? Is important the word? Is important uh, the separation? Yeah, there is. I think it, this could be the object of another class, of another talk, because there is much to be said. But you know, and it's important to show also the particular. Um, the, uh, the, the particular features in the Zoroastrian case, because it, the word is important, but maybe in a different way, in the way, in the sense that it is a ritual word, is the word of the prayer, which is very important. The, the God I told you about, which is very important, Srausha or Srosh, um, who is supposed to be the ancestor of, 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 um, of Gabriel in the Islamic tradition, is the God of the prayer. So he is also, he is on the one hand, he is the one who helps Ormaz to accomplish the creation process. And at the same time, he is a patron of the, uh, of the, of the prayer, of the main prayers. And um, um, so um, for Zoroastrianism, what is fundamental is this fight between evil and good, between demonic forces and the forces uh, um, and 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 Srosh is the patron of the victorious uh, battle against um, demons or against evil, because and 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 the the arm the weapons he uses are the prayers. So this is the importance. I mean everything which is the one can say that the, that the cosmogonic process cannot be accomplished, fully accomplished, unless one did not pray. And that's, a, the, that's a, so to say, the, the cosmogonic uh, function of the word. The word, the, the word of the prayer is protecting, because as I said, the, the cosmogonic uh, Zoroastrian vision has three stages, abstract level, then a passage to an um, uh, intermediary st step and then the creation, the, the concrete creation itself. And the second stage of this creation process is defined by the, by the, the antagonism between good and evil forces. And, and that's interesting is that um, firstly, for instance, the, the, the earth is said to be plain. And on, at the second stage, because evil attacks the earth, uh, one has um, the uh, chance to see a mountain. The mountain is a result of this antagonism. It's a good result of an antagonism. So in this case, also the prayer, and one says that um, Ormaz, the great God, uh, created the world by reciting Ahuna Vairia, which is one of the, which is a central um, um, Zoroastrian prayers. So I think it's okay. an interesting parallel one can do, um, okay. but it's okay. different. different. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Michaela. It was very interesting. I think it was also very interesting for us as a, a, a school of art because uh, reflecting on the creation, uh, no matter if it's uh, according with one tradition or, or another, but anyway, the creation is really uh, very important for every artist. And also I think that you have done a, a very interesting uh, work of, uh, during the pandemia that also it's a time in which it seems that we are restricted. I mean, we are, uh, we cannot go out. And then, and then of course, uh, we hope that with our artwork and, and everything will we'll start again. So we are going to be part of a new creation. So yeah. thank you, and uh, and uh, I hope that we will have the opportunity to 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 give other talk uh, with you, Michaela. With great pleasure.
very much for having me. Goodbye. Goodbye.